Hello, everybody. You're listening to Accounting Makes Sense, an MJ the Tutor podcast, and I'm your host, MJ. In this podcast, we are focused on helping accounting students all over the world by offering a quick warm up on various accounting and business topics, hoping to generate bigger discussions and conversations around them. If you are a SEMA case study student right now, then this episode is for you. For this episode, we're going to look at a couple of initial thoughts or tidbits on the MCS pre scene material for the May 2024 exam session. This is a similar episode format to the ones I've done previously, where I talk about some key points raised from the pre scene material. Anyway, I hope you have gained some helpful insights already from these episodes as well as from reading the pre-scene when you're doing your preparation. I would also just like to put out there as a disclaimer that these thoughts are simply my own opinion. You should not take these as the only important aspects of the pre-scene because there are obviously a lot of others that you need to consider. There would be many others as well when you read through the pre-scene. The more times, you'll be able to glean more information for yourself that you should consider. Okay, so as mentioned, our main reference point for today is the May 2024 MCS pre-scene material, which came out last week, Wednesday. I've read the pre-scene for only a couple of times, so I wouldn't really say that I know it to death, but these are, of course, just initial thoughts as well, so bear with me, okay? I'm going to offer four tidbits for today. And you should take these as clues, for lack of a better word. So these are clues in the world of the pre-scene company. Before we start off with any kind of tidbits, though, I do want to introduce a small backgrounder. Let's introduce our pre-scene company so we know just a little bit more of what industry we're in, what type of company it is. Our pre-scene company for this session is a company called Flat Hall. Now, Flat Hall is actually a quoted company operating various PBSAs, or purpose-built student accommodation as they are known. They are based in a fictitious country called Toland. So let's start with the tidbits now. The first tidbit to share is on value and the creation of that value or what is perceived to be customer value. Now, the reason that this is an important tidbit to share, when you think about PBSAs, the main thing here is obviously student accommodation. But in having said that, how does Flathole actually differentiate itself from other PBSA operators? It's already been mentioned in the pre scene material that pricing is not much different from one PBSA to other. So like the rent cannot be pushed to be a differentiating factor for the PBSAs. There's really not a lot of ways for you to differentiate in pricing is all that it's saying. But you also still want to remain competitive. So how do you actually do it? When you are operating in a market where pricing is tight and the differentiation is really challenging, it becomes crucial to focus on providing exceptional value to the customers. So how do we actually do this? The main way to provide exceptional value to customers is to actually understand your customer and what they need. We know that quality of service is one of the main areas focused on by Flat Hole to give them that competitive advantage. But quality of service is obviously broad. You know, how do you actually improve quality of service? We look at different things that perhaps affect the value chain analysis of Flat Hole. So you could use a tool like Value Chain to help you to identify which areas you can you know, add more value adding functions and take away non-value adding functions. Thinking of accommodation, you want to know how do you keep it modernized? How do you update the the accommodation? How do you keep it clean? Uh, How do you make it secure? And that kind of thing. Now, a lot of these questions are generally already initially answered by our choice of location of the buildings. So when we first acquire the building, most of these questions are answered. So like your, you know, is it a safe location? Uh, Can we modernize it? How much does it cost to actually upkeep it and that kind of thing? 
because when you buy buildings, one of the thing is age of the building, right? Older buildings have a tendency to be a lot more expensive when it comes to upgrading and maintaining. So now I'm not really saying we should always just go for newer buildings. What I'm just trying to say is that is a consideration to factor in when you are buying buildings because it can get expensive. So other things to factor, obviously, is how close the building is or the location is to the actual educational institutions, how safe is the location or the neighborhood, what are the different attractions that are close to this location. There are other things to factor in, such as maybe convenience. So for students, they may want to have coffee shops nearby. They may want to have grocery stores nearby or hospitals and many other things. And those, those factor in into the decision of whether a location is good or bad, right? One of the main thing as well, when you're thinking about safety and security and cleanliness, this might be minimum standards of quality because most PBSAs probably already think about this and this is their focus. So you always just got to find that other factors that will ultimately add to the attractiveness of your product or of your accommodations to the students. In that way, you will be able to have a little bit of a wiggle room when it comes to pricing strategy. Not that you'll be able to obviously price it very high, but there would be some room for you to at least wiggle a little bit on pricing. The next tidbit, the second tidbit, is a strange movement that is happening on the financial statements. Now, when we look at flat holes financial statements, if you take a look at operating expense line, you can note there that there is a 38.4 decrease in that line year on year. That is a significant movement, which begs to ask the question, what happened that created this decrease? Because this is really a big decrease. They must be doing something right Maybe so because that's going in the right direction, right? You're cutting your cost down, which ultimately then increases your profits and margins. As can be seen on the bottom line, you can see that flat hole has increased its net profits by 19.5% year on year. And the dollar value increase is 48 million. Now it's really a huge jump, way over the decrease of the operating expenses because the decrease of the operating expenses they only had a decrease of 34 million so they really are crunching down the numbers here because 48 million increase in profit that means that there's another 14 million somewhere that they were able to save or increase by maybe they got more market share maybe revenue helped them a little bit increase in revenue right but Definitely the bulk of that increase in net profits year on year comes from the decrease of the operating expenses. There is not much mention of how we arrived at this decrease. That's the thing. So it could be something that comes up at the exam where they actually explain to you or show you a scenario where they talk about cost-cutting programs or they're implementing something or they've implemented something or continuing something to that effect. Generally, when there is a cost-cutting program happening, uh, we should just be careful about that because the tendency is that if you cut expenses, generally there is also maybe a cut in quality. So you want to make sure that quality doesn't suffer while you are making all this cost-cutting programs. So you just want to make sure about that. The third tidbit is on accounting standards. Now I think there is room for us to actually consider IFRS 15 in a big way in this scenario or in this pre-scene. Remember that this industry works a lot with deposits and advances to secure accommodation. So Flathole actually does this in their operations. There is a big discussion about this amounts that are sitting in trade payables related to advances. It's not really uncommon that questions come up where there is a debate on whether 
you know, how do we record these advances and can we consider them as revenue, when to consider them as revenue. So if IFRS or at least IFRS 15 is not something that you are familiar with or very familiar with, you'd want to probably check that out to understand it a little better so that you know how to apply it when the question comes up on when to recognize revenue on the advances. So the last tidbit to share here is stakeholders. Now, obviously we know about management and employees and all these wonderful people that make the work possible for the business. But I do want to touch on some other stakeholders that are not so obvious. We have students plus the institutions that are kind of connected to the business. I want to highlight something that is obviously something that already can be seen is that the students may end up to be the end customers or end consumers, but your actual payer or buyer might be the parents of the students. It might, it might be the students themselves, maybe they're half funding it, you know, with work and stuff. But at the same time, you can also say that maybe the parents are helping the students to, you know, fund the rent. You got to remember that you don't have just one sole customer, which is, the, which is the target customer of students. You also have to think about an indirect kind of target customer, which are the parents of the students. In general, though, the needs may be similar. So think about it like for safety, you'd have parents wanting their kids to be safe, to, to live in a safe place, to live in a place that's secured. But at the same time, students may also feel that they may also want to be in a safe place. So some of the needs may end up to be obviously similar or the same, but just be aware of that. Now, the other stakeholder that I wanted to speak about is the institutions. We do have relationships with institutions because they are a big part of the industry. We attract the students so that they will live in the PBSA. But the biggest attraction for students to live in our PBSA is the institution that they are going to attend. If we are close to the institution, there is a higher likelihood that they will obviously live in our PBSAs. So think about it, if we have a PBSA building that is close to an institution that is very popular with engineering studies, it is highly likely that we end up with a lot of engineering students living in our building. So obviously that's a simplistic example. What I'm trying to say here is there is obviously then influence and power that these stakeholders have over the business. They can influence some of the decisions that we take and they have a little bit power over the operations that we do. So just something to really think about, okay? Stakeholders here. Anyway, that is it for me in this episode. I hope you were able to glean the same tidbits from the pre-scene as I did, maybe even more. Keep on reading that pre-scene material to gain a better understanding of the scenario. As always, I thank you for listening to Accounting Makes Sense. I am your host, MJ the Tutor. If you're keen to connect to be updated with the arrival of the next episode of this podcast, or find SEMA resources online, please head on over to my website, www.mjthetutor.com. You can also hit subscribe on whichever platform you are using to listen to this podcast. If you want to connect on social media, I'm on Facebook, X, and Instagram under the name MJ the Tutor. So I hope to see you again next time. Ciao for now!